You wouldn't catch me live tweeting this crap. <laughs> God, it's terrible. Do you mind asking before reaching over and using my stuff? Mm -hmm. Alright, I think I'm almost done. Uh, just need to do the credits and then that'll be it. No! I will not sit with this insult any longer! I challenge you to a duel! My honor has been transgressed, and I demand satisfaction. I demand satisfaction! I demand satisfaction! Where did you get a glove? Of course, as the challenge party is within your right and your privilege to dictate the exact parameters of the duel, that being the weapon and the paces. And it is within my right, as the challenger, to dictate the location and time. That being said, noon tomorrow in the courtyard. Is this because of the glue? First you take my highlighter and then my glue. What's next, my estate? I'm not dueling you. Be it so. But by refusing, you let all of chivalrous society acknowledge you as a coward and an honorless wretch. Anyone of any esteem would recognize you as being undeserving of your standing and your title. Do, do you have a title? Do you think I have a title? You are also permitted a second, to bear witness to the duel and to interfere if need be. With that, I will meet you in the courtyard noon on the morrow. Good day, sir. Well, it seems you have some sense of honor after all. Seems I do. Are you sure you still want to go through with this? It is the only way I can obtain the satisfaction I demand. Let it be so. I have chosen the parameters of our duel. Leopold, the drape. Very well. I accept your parameters. How many paces? The code standard. Ah, so you familiarized yourself with the code. Glad to see you might still have the markings of a gentleman. Let us take our places. By code standard decrees, the challenger has drawn first blood and is henceforth the victor. Assuredly, you have exhibited quite the gentlemanly attitude today. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, you hold honor. I have obtained the satisfaction I desired. Good day. Marion! 
Please see that my quarters are arranged to my liking. GPT, whatever, do that. <laughs> Ain't We Got Fun remembers Whistles the Clown. From humble beginnings in the small Texas town of Houston, Whistles the Clown emerged as a central performer in the 20th century, a show business legend who put his hometown on the map. <sighs> Whistles rewrote the rules of what it meant to be a clown. Whistles was revolution. There was nobody like him. When you talk about great American cultural exports, you've got jazz, sure, maybe Basquiat, but then you've got whistles. Whistles got a start as a rodeo clown, dodging bulls and warming up the crowds. It was there that his signature whistling was honed and perfected. We used to do shows together back in the day, you know, back in the rodeos and the clown clubs. He wouldn't even say anything, <laughs> just whistle. And the teens, oh man. They'd come down just to see that clown that whistles. Whistles catapulted to fame in the late 1950s, eventually landing on The Ed Sullivan Show, where he debuted his infamous Seven Silly Things to Do with the Rubber Chicken routine. They, they didn't often bring clowns on TV. I was seven years old when it aired. The chicken routine. Nothing like it had ever been attempted in clowning before. I mean, people were outraged. After that stunt, Ed Sullivan swore there'd never be another clown on his show. Of course, that'll change whenever Pat Boone came on the program. Whistle's controversial act made him an overnight sensation. While young boys discovered a rebellious idol, the girls had found the decade's heartthrob. Whistles became the voice of that generation. He was the first artist that they felt like belonged to them. Like glove sales sword. When Whistles embarked on his first tour across the country, young people crowded the circuses and carnivals where he headlined the Cultural Revolution had begun. But as Whistles continued performing throughout the 60s, the teeny bopper audience he cultivated came of age into a world that was crumbling apart. His young fans realized the world wasn't all funny business. There was unfairness and they were not going to put up with it. When you look at the political movement that they started, the ideas taken from Whistles' work were very apparent. They were clowning to make the world a better place. Many loved Whistles, but others were shocked and hurt by his complicated behavior. There were a few times that Whistles would ask people to come smell this flower, and then he would spray them with water from a hose hidden inside of it. It sparked widespread condemnation of inappropriate clowning. But that was just the kind of world he was born into. I think situations like these remind us why it's essential to separate the fool from the tomfoolery. Between mounting controversy and comedic burnout, the early 70s saw Whistle's career slow as a new generation of clowns entered the spotlight. That was around the time he started replacing his signature whistling with you know, mute actions and invisible obstacles. I, I think it was his way of trying to stay relevant. Mainstream success made him tired of the Whistle's character. He wanted to do something new that would show off his range, but the world saw that Whistle's time in the spotlight had passed. The generation of talent that came up idolizing Whistles began surpassing him. The best work he could get was as an entertainer for the U.S. military. They send him overseas to entertain the troops, but they seemed all fed up with it, of course, being at wars and all. Whistles' routines were growing stale. I saw new, younger clowns juggling five, six, seven, even eight balls at a time. They were taking bits right out of his playbook. I saw short clowns with tall hats and tall clowns with short hats. I mean, it should have been his renaissance, but instead he was out doing a mime act. As the early 90s saw teens embrace a punk influence revival of clowning, it was a perfect time for Whistles to stage his grand return. Whistles come back aimed at bringing kids back to the classic era of clowning. You know, brought him relevance in another 30 years of touring and performing. You could go to any of his shows and you could see grandfathers, their sons, their grandsons, all there to get a look at true genius. 
Whistle's last performance was in the winter of 2022. Along with old friends and special guests, Whistles took audiences through a career-spanning set of his best bits, ending the night whistling his signature, Richard Whitting's Ain't We Got Fun. When I heard the news, I said, no, it can't be true. You're, you're, you're clowning me. When I met him, I was truly taken aback by how down to earth he was. He wasn't just a clown, he was a gentleman. You might not expect this of a clown, but he was kind of a jokester. He played pranks, and he had a real light-hearted sense of humor. I think that's why people loved working with him so much. To this day, I still dream about him every day. I mean, we lived so many lifetimes in just a couple years. Whistles was buried Monday morning along with 37 of his peers in a child-sized coffin. I guess this ain't no dang touch screen. Looks like one. Everything good? We rolling? Yeah, we're good. We got it. Hey, guys. Oh, hi. You guys got here a lot earlier than expected. Good morning, Miss Fletcher. Hey. How are you doing? Doing great. You got here at the perfect time. We'd be just for breakfast. Okay. Oh, <laughs> forgot about this part. Uh, yeah, that's a trig. Can you, uh... can, can you hear me? Oh, loud and clear, I'm sure. Uh, you wanna, wanna head inside? Yeah. yeah. Alvin Fletcher, a household name for some, but to me, a fellow graduate of William Howard Taft High School. I hadn't thought about Alvin much since she graduated a year ahead of me, but recently, I was surprised to learn that she had been a game show contestant with a five win streak under her belt. No small feat, to be sure. When Alvin reached out to me looking to be interviewed about her time on the show and her upcoming return, it was hard to say no to an old acquaintance. So I hope we're not interrupting your morning. <laughs> no, I said this on my whole week right now. You guys got here at the perfect time, actually. Yeah, so what do you normally do on a Saturday morning? Well, after we eat, you usually do some trivia training. We? Oh, yeah, being my girlfriend. She's just upstairs on the trivia board. Ah, I see. And you do this every week? <sighs> Honestly, I, I kind of do it every day. I'm kind of in between jobs at the moment, so it's like I'm really working on getting ready to be back on the show. Gotcha. I guess the earnings from your last couple of wins mean you don't have to worry about that kind of financial stuff anymore. Right. That, that was a long time ago now, and I mean, yeah, I guess I did win a bit of money and stuff, but no, that, I spent that out a while ago. B kind of, she handles the whole thing, it's a situation. What she means is she put almost $12,000 on red and the ball landed on double zero. Bethany? George? Alvin didn't say you were supposed to look at oh, Let me help you with that. You know I can't look at them. I'm not supposed to see them. Here, we have to bring these into the game. Right? No, no, you have to go with new ones. I saw those. It's fine. They were mostly face up and you looked away really fast. No, 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 no. I'm sure it's some of them. One of them was Abraham Lincoln. I literally didn't do any questions with Abraham Lincoln. Well, now I know that. I'm not supposed to know that. Hey. Fine, let me put this stuff down with George first. Bethany Henriksen graduated from William Howard Taft High School the year after Alvin Fletcher. She tells me that they had first met in a shared English class and the relationship had bloomed from there. When Alvin graduated, she decided to take a break year to let Bethany catch up with her. She still hasn't made up her mind. Do you want to help me rewrite some new questions for today? Um, Bethany was way too good for her. Sure. I could ask you I could ask you a couple questions for the for the for the bill. Uh we should probably do something about the Korean War. Oh yeah, good idea. What do we know about that? Um Eisenhower was the general, then was the president. Oh, we can have that be the answer. What president was he? Oh, I don't know. Let me see. You know. You're pretty good at this. Yeah, well, you get used to it. Alvin's really only good with, like, presidents and Benjamin Franklin, so she asks me to stick to questions about those, and, you know, there's only, like, 50 presidents or something, so you see them a lot. Okay, well, yeah, but that's still really impressive. So how are things with you, George? You're like Michael Moore now with the documentaries. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, one day I could hope I, I hope I'd have films that good. Uh, my last one, it was a bit of a self-portrait, I uh, screened it at a few places, festivals, uh, but it didn't get picked up, so I'm um, back to the drawing board. 
It's okay. Hey, maybe this will be your big break. Alvin just needs to convince the TV people to, to let her come back. What? They, they haven't asked her back yet? What? No. She has to audition again, but they're going to let her. She just has to ask to be on the Champions episode, but they're going to. We just have to support her. No! What if they say no? Sure. This will all be for nothing. There'll be no story here. There'll be no film. Suddenly everything made sense. The setup, the trick. Alvin and Bethany from my old high school were here to waste my time, to take me lower than I already was after the failure of life in me. They didn't care about trivia. They just wanted to see me fail again. But I would not let that happen. I'm not falling for it. What? Hey, is that a camera? This, this whole thing is just some big joke, isn't it? What are you talking about? It's not a joke. You, your pathetic life, you and B dating, doing trivia all day. It's, it's, it's also a big joke on me, isn't it? <laughs> Excuse me? Hey, I, I don't want to be on camera. You're going to help, okay? Look, I don't know what's going on with you, but I'm going to ignore what you just said. We're ready. Do you have the cards? Dude, I'm going to leave if you put me on TV. Another 200 for me. I'll take another famous men of American history for 200, Pat. Babe, I asked you not to call me that. It's a different show, anyway. Oh, great. Now they consume it. Shut up, Jerry. B, you can't yell at a contestant. They don't do that on the show. Yeah, well, I bet most contestants are actually nice people, unlike him. So just read the card, please. Who was a general in the Korean War and a future U.S. president? Um. Oh, which number was he again? Bethany hadn't called me Jerry since we were in the second grade together. Sorry, no hints. I know this one. They normally tell you the number. You, you have to give me the number. What is it, Kevin? Dwight D. Eisenhower, the 34th- Kevin! You didn't even buzz in! There are no buzzers. We're just sitting here. New rule! George is not allowed to speak unless I call him. I don't remember when she stopped. I wish I could go back to Jerry and tell him to forget about her now before it was too late. Kevin, too. He's I wasn't cheating, I knew the answer! It doesn't matter, the question was for me, so I have to answer it. That's not how the show works! Well, this is a different version, this is my version! Actually, it's my version, since I'm the host and I'm the one in charge of the rules. See? Hey, our rules. Well, what am I supposed to do? Compete! I'm trying to! Well, not like that! <sighs> Alvin Fletcher. A nobody to the lucky. But I've never been so lucky. I knew when she reached out that this interview would be trouble. I had never thought highly of her. It's a shock that anyone like that would have a five-win streak. Good riddance to the both of them. Nothing, I guess. I don't know. It's crap on TV. Hey, Alexa, turn on Dancing with the Stars or something like that. It's crap TV. <laughs>